God tells us uh, what was happening uh, with the people of Israel as they traveled uh, through the desert, worshiping God, uh, giving their hearts to the Lord just as we have been doing. And in Exodus chapter 40, verse 36 through 38, it says this, In all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, well, they did not set out until the day that it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord over the tabernacle by day and the fire was in the cloud by night in the sight of all the Israelites during all their festivals and travels. The word of the Lord for the people of God this morning. Amen. I'm excited this morning. You know why? My house was crazy this morning, and so was this. <laughs> that means God is up to something good. Isn't that right? You know, about well, the time I started breaking out in a sweat at home, I started thinking, you know, God must be up to something good today. And we've had a good time of worship this morning. So I'm excited. Hey, as Harry said early this, in the service, we've been focusing on tabernacling of people on the move for the past several Sundays. And again today, we will be focusing our attention on being a tabernacle. What does it mean, this word tabernacling and being a a people on the move. The, the verse that we just read in Exodus, and I invite you to follow along in your Bibles, chapter 40, and put your finger there because we're going to flip around a little bit. But the scripture that we just heard this morning um, is really about this long, comes at the end of a long process, this elaborate building of a tabernacle this thing called a tabernacle. And, and there were all these lengthy descriptions of how it was supposed to happen and how they were supposed to build it. And it goes on for chapters and chapters in the book of Exodus. And finally, we get to this really important part in the, in the word. And see, the theme of tabernacling has deep claims upon us as a people. It wasn't just for the time of Exodus. It's for us. And we will look at that this morning of how important and foundational it is for us as the people of God. Now, after Moses got done constructing this tabernacle, it looked a little something like this. Like that. You might notice, you can't see really good, but it's like a giant tent. There's stakes. It was designed to be mobile for people that were on the move. Actually, it looks like a giant tent for God to go camping in, doesn't it? It does. Watch out creation, you know. I don't know if you've ever seen Dave uh, Lemon's uh, tent, but it looks something like that. It's a giant tabernacle, and together we have this vision of what it might have looked like, the people of Israel following God um, through the wilderness, this giant tent. You know, you have to ask the question, why did they build a tent for God, don't you? Or better yet, why did God ask them to build a tent? I mean, it is kind of a weird thought. So what I want us to do is to look at chapter 25 now, verse 8 in Exodus, and we learn something a little bit about how and why this big tent originated. God was speaking to Moses in verse 8, and he actually says this, have them make me a sanctuary so that I may dwell among them in accordance with all that I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and all of its furniture so you can make it, so you shall make it. Now you see up to this point, God was dwelling on Mount Sinai, right? Up to this point in Exodus, you can have this picture of this giant mountain and the cloud, the presence of God, the cloud of glory was on top of this mountain, and the Israelites kind of had to keep their distance because if they got too close, they would die. And actually only Moses could really come close to the presence of God. So this is a really significant move that God is making here in chapter 25. God is saying, I want to be with you. That was his message to Moses. I want to be with you. Now, think about the beauty 
of this, just for a moment. Here, are, remember who the Israelites are. Here it is, the God of the universe, the creator of the heavens and the earth and everything in the earth. And he sang to this band of homeless, escaped slaves, poor, dirty, smelly vagabonds wandering around, you know, who had been abused, terribly abused. We can't even imagine how abused they were. They were tortured. Some of us in church would call that damaged goods, right? You've heard that. And yet, the Most High God was saying, I want to live in the midst of you. I want to be so very near you that I want you to pitch a tent so that I can be in the midst of you. Isn't that powerful? That is powerful. It should be at the core of who we are. We really need to wrap our heads around how beautiful of a message that is. So tabernacling is God making his home among us. It's a beautiful picture. But it isn't just a word for Exodus. The whole of scripture continues throughout the story of the Bible to build on this notion that God wants to make his home among us. God wants to be very near us, so much so that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. God wanted to be so close that he became flesh and was born as a tiny babe that we know as Jesus who lived and walked with us, like us, ate like us. God wanted to be so very near us that he was willing to die a painful death, a death of a criminal on the cross so that we could be transformed into glorious tabernacles of his presence. He took took us, like the Israelites, damaged goods and washed us so that these shabby dwellings that we have could become this glorious temple and shelter for his presence. Do you see how foundational that is for us? This Exodus passage, nothing coincidental about what God is doing to form his people. And then we read about that in the second chapter of Acts. I want you to just think about that. What happens in the second chapter of Acts? The Holy Spirit in what? Tongues of fire. Do you see it? rests on their heads and fills them with his presence and then sends them out again to the ends of the earth to be tabernacles of the Most High. And if you're here today and you haven't experienced that, I want to make sure that you have that opportunity. And when we sing after my sermon, I'm going to be at the cross and I want to pray for you because that is what it's all about right there in the first verse of the Bible that we're looking at today in Exodus. That was God's intention from the beginning to be close to us, to be near us, no matter what, how we come and what we look like. But there's always a but in the message. This powerful truth has an equal claim, two powerful claims within two Verses. Not only does the Most High God want to be very, very near us and dwell in our midst, but this same God is on the move. He's moving, and he wants us to join them. I want you to look at verse 36 now in chapter 40. In all of the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. You know, it's a little bit like a slow dance with God, right? I know, I didn't grow up to Mennonite, and so I danced growing up. And slow dances were one of the most awkward things you could do. For one, I had really big hair, and it wasn't good. But anyway, you were supposed to, <laughs> you were supposed to stand really close, right? And you moved together to the rhythm that's slow dancing but you're supposed to as the lady you're supposed to follow the guide's lead in all that right and 
it was this awkward dance that you did. And I think that's a beautiful image with how it is with God. He wants to be very, very close to us. And we do this movement dance with God and we try to follow his lead and not you know, get out of rhythm and step on his toes or anything or vice versa. That's what it's like here. That's my picture anyway. Um, a non-ethnic Mennonite woman's picture of what it's like to follow this guy that wants to be very close and yet at the same time is on the move. He's asking us to follow his lead. And this again is present throughout the whole scripture. It's not something that just happened in Exodus. It just continues to be built on the same idea. We are intended to be a pilgrim people, a people on a journey not of this earth. And Jesus himself embodied that, right? He was always on the move, he said, doing what I see the Father doing. And he taught the disciples the same thing. He taught the disciples to go out and move and take the presence of God and the power of God with them wherever they went. One scripture that sticks out in my mind is Luke chapter 9. Jesus is walking along with the disciples and a man comes up on the road and he says, hey, I will follow you wherever you go. I am ready, Lord. And Jesus turns to him and says, the foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. He didn't have a home because he was always on the move. And he's calling us to be that way as well. Not only that, but he commanded the disciples, the very last thing he said was, Go ye therefore into all the nations, preaching the gospel to all and baptizing them in my name. It was always his intention for us to be a moving tabernacle. And then just think about Acts chapter 8, when Philip right, gets literally teleported by the Spirit to another place. I mean, I think God wants us to get that part of our journey. We are a pilgrim people. We are on the move with this God who is with us and is also on the move. Uh, so these two truths that we're talking about, this God who wants to be near and a God who is on the move, were so foundational for the people of Israel that actually in Leviticus 23, God tells them to make it a feast. So Imagine now that the Israelites every year are going to have the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. And every year they make a tent, right? And for seven days they get in the tent and they eat their meals and they worship together every year. And they retell the story so that they remember who they are and whose they are, that they serve a God that's on the move. And while he's on the move, he provides and so they, it's a time of thanksgiving. So God intended this to be at the very core of who we are. But the question is, how do we, what does this mean for us, right? I mean, we're kind of permanent, a permanent kind of society. We like to sink our roots in really deep. So how can we stay very close to God and yet be on the move as a church, as a people of God. What does it mean for us here, practically speaking, at Nesville? Because it sounds like a bunch of platitudes, right? Well, I don't know that I can really answer the question thoroughly, but I think we can take a couple of cues from the, the, the idea of a tent. Um, you know, the idea of a tent, I don't know if we still have, we don't have it up there anymore, but I'm not suggesting that we all go and live in a tent, although it would be pretty fun. You know, have camp meetings all the time, being in tents, I would enjoy that. But what I am suggesting is that we live in such a way that we are mobile. In other words, don't drive your stakes in too deeply. Um, when you think about camping, I, I came up with this because of a famous camping trip. I was a Girl Scout and I was really proud of the fact that I knew how to camp and set up a tent. And in our first year of marriage, I don't know if you remember this, Harry and I went camping for our Mennonite conference as young adults. And we had tents and we went up at Highland Retreat, this is in Virginia, and we pitched our tent. Well, I was maybe a little uncoordinated, so my job was to hammer the stakes in, 
right? Well, Harry tended to everything else. So I'm hammering the stakes way in. And I remember Harry saying, don't, don't hammer them in too far, right? And I was, knew there was a storm coming, so I'm like hammering them really good because when the wind comes, that tent is going to stay. Well, the wind came, the storm came. We didn't even get to sleep in the tent. And we went back to take the tent home after it was dried out, and we had to leave the tent stakes in the ground. I mean, they wouldn't even come up. That's how far down I did it. <laughs> you know, and I think we have a tendency as a people, we want to feel secure. We want to feel stable in life. And so we have a tendency to drive those stakes really deep down into the ground, symbolically speaking. I mean, and it could take a lot of different forms of what that might look like, but we have a tendency to do that. And doing that makes it so it's hard for us to put ourselves out there, to be on the move, to think about something different. You know, we can drive the stakes down in a lot of different ways. It can be physical, it can be mental, it can be spiritual. For example, maybe you're just getting married and all of your friends are buying houses, right? And you, you want to do that too, but there's something in you that's saying, don't buy the house yet, just rent, because I want you to be free to follow my call. And so a couple might choose to rent instead of buying a house. That's an example of maybe not putting those tent stakes too far deep. Or maybe you're looking for a job, and there are a lot of great job opportunities, and you want to jump at the first one you can get because they're so attractive, and yet... There's something in you that says, don't do it. Don't do it because this isn't lining up with my plan for you. So maybe you just wait a little. That's another example of loosening the stakes. Uh, something that I remember very um, vi vividly is when Harry and I were waiting to go on the mission field. Now we had been for a year with yes, and we were supposed to turn around and go right back, but it took a year and a half of waiting before the mission board was ready to send us again. And for a year and a half, we were like, do we buy this can opener or don't we? Do we get a gas grill? No, that's too expensive, we get the charcoal grill. And everything we asked ourselves was like this major deal because we really understood that we needed to be free. And the more we drove the tent stakes down, the harder it was gonna be when the mission board finally said it was time to go. So those are just some little ways of how we can keep ourselves loose. Now, sometimes we drive down the stakes too deeply, spiritually speaking. You know, I think all of us can feel like we've got a corner on our understanding of God. And we can say, okay, I've got it. This is what I believe. There's no changing that. But yet God is always inviting us to expand our understanding. God is a God of revelation. He is always giving us fresh revelation. So if we drive the stakes down too deeply spiritually, we might miss out on the movement and the maturity that God wants to do in our lives. So there are a lot of ways that we can do that. Maybe you're here and you, you feel like you have done that. You've kind of driven that stake down spiritually and this is where you stand. Just say, God, I'm open to a new revelation. Just invite God to show you new things. The second thing we can do after we loosen our tent pegs a little bit is focus. Keep watch on the Spirit of God, the cloud of presence. Keep watching for the Spirit to move in your midst. You know, Harry and I were on this trip uh, taking Harrison to the airport and we were using our iPhones as the GPS, right? And we're following along and it's talking to you and we have it piping through our radio, life is good. Well, after a while it didn't say anything. And I'm not really familiar with New York and you don't wanna miss the turn in New York. So I started looking at this thing and I noticed that it was the time wasn't uh, decreasing at all. Uh, there, the the turn that we were going to take was still about the same distance away. And then I looked and the car wasn't moving on the map. Very bad sign. So I, so I had to actually reboot. You'll be glad to know that it came back just in the nick of time for us to take that really important turn. But the fact of the matter is, 
God is like that in our lives, we need to keep focusing ourselves on the movement of God and look for the spiritual signs that let us know that God is indeed moving or he is resting. And there are some clear ways that we can discern that, and I have a few little things. Um, For one thing, freedom. God always, always, always moves us in a direction of freedom, of greater freedom. We see that in Exodus, God moving the children of Israel to a place of freedom. We see that in Acts, when the Holy Spirit comes and fills the people and sends them out in freedom, freedom to proclaim the gospel with boldness, freedom to speak the language in, in in the way that they needed to. The church was released all over, and then there's freedom in worship a freedom to just worship God in the spirit. So God always moves in a direction of freedom. And you can think of many examples throughout history in the church of how God always invites his people into greater freedom. Another sign to know that God is moving is healing. God always moves us in a direction of healing. And I'm not necessarily speaking of physical healing, though that was a very big part of Jesus' ministry. And I believe that's why Jesus did miracles, because God always moves us toward healing. But the healing that I'm speaking of this morning is a, a spiritual healing, a healing of relationships and forgiveness, a healing of our spiritual selves, our soul. God always desires our healing and moves us in that direction, even in death. God moves us toward eternal life, right? And that is our ultimate healing. God is a God of healing, spiritual, physical, relational, and emotional. And lastly, God always moves us toward expansion. God is always expanding the borders. Always, always, always. The borders of everything, our minds, where we live, our circle of friends, the people that we share the gospel with. If God is moving, you will see that God is also expanding in your life, expanding the borders of his kingdom. In the Exodus story, God provides, you'll see, for the foreigners when they celebrate the feast, the slaves and the foreigners among the children of Israel when they're sacrificing the lamb. You can look at that later in Exodus chapter 12. But you see, God always moving toward including people. And it's also true with the spirits working in Acts. Everywhere they go, God is expanding the borders. You know, Peter and the, and the unclean food and going to the tanner's house. Or, or Philip with the Ethiopian, inviting them, seeing the spirit at work. God is always, always expanding. So those are just three ways that you can... Keep watch on the cloud of presence and notice if God is on the move in our midst. And finally, I got a lot of stuff. Finally, (laughs) we want to be a people of God. If we want to be a people of God following after God, we must remember whose we are. We can't lose sight of the fact that we serve a vagabond God. Really, think about it. A God who roams the earth since Exodus, who showed us that in Jesus Christ, a God that is always on the move, wandering and looking for us and running after us. And that really should be all over us. God's thumbprints should be all over us, that we are free and moving people. And not only that, but that we are these tabernacles. We have the power of the Holy Spirit, the fame, the flame of fire resting in us and on us, just as the pillow of fire. And with that, we go into the world, right? Carrying the Spirit with us, lighting the way wherever we go. Now, we're a church that does a lot of sending, right? Uh, We just sent out a team to Peru who took the healing, literally the healing presence of God to the villages they were in. We are going to be sending today our our NYF um, into Mexico to bring shelter and to tell others about Jesus Christ. We're a sending bunch of people here at Nesville. But it doesn't have to be a program. Every single one of us is a tabernacle of God's presence. And we need to be mindful that when we go out of here, We are literally taking the presence of God into our workplaces, on the golf course, 
in our neighborhoods, into the hospital, into the grocery store, we are bringing the presence of God. And the reason why we do that, God made us that way, informed us that way since Exodus, is because he wants others to know him. And that is what we're here for, friends, to be pilgrims right here where we are, knowing that we have the presence of God. So if we want to remember whose we are, we just ask God to show you each day, to open your eyes to the divine appointments he has for each of you. And be confident that as you go, the Holy Spirit is going with you. Keep your eyes wide open for the opportunities God has for you each day, and he will use you. Now, I want you to take a look around here real fast. Look at everybody. Just look all around. Imagine for a moment how many pillars of fire you see in this congregation. That's a lot of fire coming out of this place. And I want you to imagine now all of us going out from this place, all the different things that we're going to do today, the places we're going to eat lunch, and imagine the opportunity God has for us today for this group of people. Imagine how the kingdom of God can be expanded. It's exciting. Isn't that exciting? And that should be at the core of who we are and what we do as the people of God. I'm excited about Exodus. It wasn't for them way back now. then. It's for us right now. And I hope you get that, how exciting it is to be a tabernacle of God's presence and that we're called to be a people on the move. For his glory. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, I thank you so much that you came to this earth and walked with us and lived with us, ate with us, and taught us what it means to be a people on the move and to be a tabernacle for the Most High God. I thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice on the cross for us that through your blood and through your sacrifice, you have washed us white as snow and prepared a place for your Holy Spirit to dwell. The Father three in one, I thank you that you want to be very close to each of us. And I just pray, God, that we can go from this place mindful of the tabernacle you have made us, that we can keep our tent stakes loose and follow after you, that we can keep our eyes on your spirit at work and be mindful of what that looks like, and that we can remember that we are loved by you just as we are and that you have your thumbprint on us. So God, by the power of your spirit, make that true for us this morning. And we ask these things in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen.